Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, I'm going to wait just one more minute before we get started to let a few more people join us before noon. Okay, um, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for joining um, your hour with APA Virginia, um, sponsored by the Berkeley Group. Thank you very much. Um, so we have a great presentation ahead of us today. Um, our speaker is Bailey Bullock, um, who will be presenting critical media analysis to inspire and evaluate praxis. So I think it's a really thought provoking and interesting um, and timely presentation that we have this afternoon. Um, I just wanted to run through a couple of housekeeping items. Um, please feel free to visit our website, um, which I will link along with other helpful links in the chat momentarily, um, where you can find um, information on upcoming and previous webinars. And I will also share our YouTube link, um, our YouTube chapter link, excuse me, where you can find previously recorded webinars. Um, we really do in question, excuse me, we really do um, encourage questions. Um, so there will be a Q&A portion at the end. Um, please submit your questions via the Q&A box rather than the chat box, just to allow Bailey to keep track of all inquiries. Um, but you may feel free to private message me using the chat feature if you have any logistical questions. Um, you can also use the raise hand feature to request to be unmuted. Um, during the Q&A portion. Um, but otherwise, I'm going to run down Bailey's bio. So Bailey is a student in the Masters of Urban and Regional Planning and Masters of Science in Transportation Programs at the University of New Orleans. She centers her career on the pursuit of mobility justice through shaping transportation policy and the urban form. Bailey holds a BA in sociology from Mississippi State University and has interned with the city of Jackson, Mississippi and Alliance Transportation Group. She's had the privilege of spending her early 20s serving with AmeriCorps, teaching English at universities in Columbia with the Fulbright program and, and working in health insurance and public health. Currently, Bailey is a graduate research assistant at the UNO Transportation Institute where she engages in projects related to community engagement freight transportation and active transportation infrastru infrastructure. So um, quite the experienced speaker we have ahead of us. Um, so without further ado, I will pass it over to Bailey. Um, but otherwise, please keep your eyes peeled on the chat box with helpful links. Um, and there will also be um, an email um, follow up to all attendees um, afterwards with the presentation slide deck and contact information but I will pass it over now. Thank you everyone for joining. Awesome, thank you so much um, Jillian for setting this up and for my introduction. So hi everyone, my name is Bailey um, and I'm gonna talk about critical media analysis. Um, I think this is a really important topic when it comes to all of the debates and public discourse we have around um, issues that intersect with our work. I'm gonna share my screen. So the background on this presentation is that it's based on my research that I developed in one of my courses on land use and transportation planning. I was looking at discourse related to opposition to bus, bus rapid transit. As we know, whenever some kind of new, you know, transportation project goes in or sometimes a housing development, there will be a lot of pushback, um, sometimes from homeowners or other um, members of the public who, you know, are opposed to something, they'll come out and speak out against it. Um, and I was interested in what went into that, like what were the reasons that people were opposing it. And so I looked at um, several case studies um, and I made up, a, I came up with a typology of themes uh, that are prevalent in BRT discourse. And one of the most prominent themes is the capture of decision makers by the opponents to projects. So we're first gonna talk about a framework for critical media literacy, um, which comes from Kellner and Share 2005. 
Um, and I, this is a really good paper, even though it's from 2005, it was very forward thinking about the internet and this Um, it seems like I've lost Bailey on my end, um, but I'm not sure if that's just unique to me. Oh, and, and there's different um, elements that kind of build up the message you're seeing, even if it's really simple or small. The next one is that there's codes and conventions and that the media messages are constructed using a creative language with its own rules. And um, there's, one of the several examples of this are the different formats we have for media. So newspaper articles are laid out in a specific way. There's a certain format that you see for LinkedIn posts. Um, there are with TV shows, they have their own format. You have the six o'clock news, the 10 o'clock news, or even if you watch YouTube videos, there's kind of a standardized introduction in a way that people always sign off. And so that that's like the format. And then there's these rules about which words you use or which messages mean what in different contexts. Um, so that's our second principle. Another one is audience decoding. So you have these messages that are constructed and you have these creative rules that guide what words are being said or not being said or the way that they're being said. And then the audience has to know how to break that down. And so different people experience the same message, media message differently. And that's one reason why um, media literacy is important is because you have to have some kind of framework to break down the tools. And so, you know, there's like cross-cultural examples where if the people that are producing the message are only gearing it to one kind of audience and they're not including kind of opportunities for different people to be able to break it down, it's very kind of like specific or coded to one thing. Um, that can be, you know, an example of that. Also, there's sometimes you'll see people like read the same article and they'll come away with completely different takeaways or they'll see the same message and it'll mean something completely different. Um, so that's, that's something to keep in mind is it's not just about the construction of the message, but also the perception of the message. And sometimes those things are at odds. Um, there's also the content of the message, which is that media have embedded and points of views. Everything has a point of view or a value. There's some things that we just kind of take as truth or for granted, but actually there's some kind of, you know, incentive or there is, um, you know, effort put into making that that way. So one thing I like to talk about is home ownership. You know, people will just say, well, it's better to own your house than to rent. But there's reasons that it's that way. And it's because the government has, you know, created tax incentives. You can write off your interest on your mortgage. Um, we give a lot of social power to people who are homeowners. We don't have a lot of renter protections in this country. But if you look at another country like Austria has most of their housing is publicly subsidized housing. And people are perfectly happy living with that because it's maybe they're not. I don't know. But the people do live like that because that is the incentive that the government has set up there. And so even if we see something as objective, like it's not necessarily it's not objective. So we have to look at that and that goes all the way down from, you know, things we see in the media, but also things that are communicated from the government um, that we have to understand that there is a value and a point of view that's being expressed that maybe doesn't align with um, the interest of everyone involved. And then finally, there's the motivation. So media are organized to gain profit and or power. And this is not exclusive to media companies um, like TV companies, like corporations or um, you know, enterprises. Um, it also applies to individuals. So if you think about people, especially in the past like 10 or 15 years with the rise of social media and individuals being on social media in a way where they're able to market themselves and build their brand, you know, the, the kinds of things you put out about yourself is in order to, you know, pursue, you know, profit or power for your own interests. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. So the things you post on LinkedIn, maybe are to make yourself, you know, look like the person that you want to be seen as, and as somebody that can be trusted, that's knowledgeable. Um, you know, I'm on the job market right now, so I'm kind of putting myself out there and trying to make sure that, you know, people 
know how to contact me and can, you know, bring me in to do things and hopefully earn some money. And everybody has that going on. And so we have to understand that that goes all the way down to the individual level, but it's true at every level. So this is my original research on bus rapid transit. Um, I looked at 17 of 39 bus rapid transit systems in the US. I used the list from Wikipedia because it seemed to be the only complete one. Um, and I only looked at projects that are complete. I wasn't looking at um, projects that were in progress. Um, these are the themes I came up with and public opposition to BRT, which include cost of ridership, resistance to dedicated bus lanes, displacement of people that the projects are ostensibly going to serve, um, externalities around equity and the environment, service delivery, because there was an example of they were going to put in a new bus rapid transit line, but in order to accommodate that, they were going to cut service somewhere else in the city. Um, and so that's a concern or people will say, well, they don't you know, run the bus enough to justify um, you know, making it a bus rapid transit. Um, there's also the impact on businesses and pedestrian retail, as well as involvement and representation in the planning process. So some examples, um, I have two here. One is on the theme of impact of business and retail in Berkeley, California. Um, this was in 2010 that this article was written about um, a project. And I'm pretty sure this was on applying for like funding for a feasibility study. It wasn't actually applying for funding to fund the project itself. So I think that's something to keep in mind um, that even at that stage, it can still be very incendiary. Um, we see in this article, a council member as a primary actor and that's a theme in several of the other places that I looked at. Um, he made several comments speaking on behalf of the disability community and saying that the BRT would have a negative impact on access. Um, for that segment of the population, um, when in fact the pro BRT contingent was using that as a central argument for why they needed to do BRT because it would be expand access for people who are disabled. Um, the council member also stated that they should only implement the BRT if they give free rides to business owners and have corridor connections. And in my opinion, that's letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, so that's something to keep in mind that he was kind of coming up against and saying, putting this like almost arbitrary requirement on being able to move forward with that because of all the arguments that it was negatively impacted business owners. Um, there were plenty of public comments in support of BRT. People were coming to public meetings and they were writing letters of support. And there was also support from a transit advocacy organization. Um, but there was a street vendor that stated that the BRT is against the wishes of the community and saying that decisions shouldn't be made by a flow of money, even though the primary argument against BRT is that eliminating, eliminating parking would force the business to close. So that's um, an interesting argument, I would say, that it's hurting the community and the community is business owners, but she doesn't want it to be guided by the flow of money. Um, so, like I said, the most vocal opposition came from the street vendors on Telegraph, which was the thoroughfare that was going to be affected. Um, the arts and community, craft community were claiming that two-way traffic would lead to more gridlock and eventually forcing them to move away. Um, and they said, even without BRT, parking is already affected. Tourists and shoppers don't come to look at BRT. Why would they come to a half-dead town and spend a fortune on parking when they can get free parking at a shopping mall? And this really speaks to the I like the fact that this person's coming it from the assumption that everybody's driving and he's talking about looking at BRT, but that's not how BRT works. You don't just look at it. The idea is that people are going to ride it and so they don't need parking. And I think that just really speaks to the mindset that people have. And it goes back to that construction of the messaging and the values that go into the messaging. And those are all the things that build up your message with these uh, assumptions that in this case are being spoken, um, but sometimes they're unspoken. Um, and then going back to that street vendor, she had been a street vendor on Telegraph for 30 years. And she said, I hope this project is not directed by the flow of money. And then she also talked about where is the legitimacy to push this plan forward against the wishes of the community, which, you know, that's fair to be concerned about the wishes of the community, but according to 
the article, there had been a lot of public support for this, including from the transit advocacy organization and people writing in to talk about um, how it would positively impact um, the well-being of people that are disabled. And then, um, you know, yeah, that basically I just said that, um, but several people focused a support of BRT at a meeting and at least five people supported the build option in letters. And then this one I just think is very striking, this comment. He talks about why would I study cutting off my five fingers, referring to the feasibility study for the project. And he said these five fingers are the street vendors, the businesses, the residents, the disabled people, and the frail and the elderly. And when I think about that and you look at it, you look at especially the frail and the elderly and disabled people, you know, those are people that sometimes are not um, eligible for driver's licenses. They're not, you know, they don't benefit from our car dependent infrastructure. There's pe people that do need to, you know, travel in cars, but I think it really kind of dismisses this, this multifaceted transportation conversation that there's more than one mode of transportation options and that can be you know walking biking riding the bus and driving and i think it's very it just kind of shows the single um focus on one mode of transportation which is assuming everybody needs to get around in a car um so another one that we looked at kind of touches on some things from the last ones but it's specifically um, focused on involvement and representation and this is the a bus rapid transit line that they were going to put through um, eight, through the Eagle Rock community in Los Angeles County. And it was supposed to connect um, California State University Northridge with other places in the community. And it would um, probably help traffic pretty much because it would get a lot of people out of their cars, which is the idea. So they were going to put a BRT project on Colorado Boulevard. This is from 2021. Um, and so in this um, article, we see misalignment between council members and other government officials. Um, so it's unelected officials kind of versus not necessarily, but maybe not always in alignment with people who are, you know, staff or, you know, commissioners that aren't the elected city, well, not city, but then elected like county council. Um, there was an election of an anti-BRT council member during this process. His name was Kevin DeLeon. And he was actually in a scandal last year where there were some video, some, some audio tapes leaked of him and Yuri Martinez and some other folks making some offensive and racist comments. So I think that is an interesting point to bring in when we look at some comments that he's made and where he's kind of coming from and who he's supporting. Um, there was a coalition that consolidated the stakeholders and synthesized the interest into a unified vision. And they made this um, beautiful boulevard plan that really brought in all the interest, including the interest of drivers and business owners in a way that kind of supported the mobility of everybody in a complete street, instead of just focusing on the cars as um, what needs to have the throughput. There was this recurrent idea of not enough community input, and that begs the question of how much is enough. Um, there were numerous public meetings, including pop-ups and working groups, and you see homeowners and drivers carved out as a distinct class. And I like to call them property leveraging stakeholders because they have this asset that they're trying to protect and um, they're trying to protect their access to that asset as well. And so that there's this incentive that kind of doesn't exist for people who aren't um, homeowners or drivers that have a car. Um, there was harassment of BRT supporters online and in person. Um, and there was online debate of who counts as a true stakeholder. So there were people being accused online of like, you're not really from the community, you're not really a stakeholder, you know, your opinion doesn't matter. Um, so the idea was that people would take the bus if it were faster, more reliable. And if they had the dedicated lanes, um, the bus travel would improve and that would encourage people to that don't need to be driving to get on the bus and that would help with the congestion. Um, the single car option incorporated design ideas recommended by the Beautiful Boulevard, which is a coalition of residents, business owners, bus riders, cyclists, and transit advocates who supported the dedicated bus lanes. And then they also got um, support from some elected officials and the state assembly members. And something to keep in mind about this is that the, the idea for the single bus lane was, or, or the single car lane was to preserve parking. 
so that people could still access the shops. And um, they talked about it creating a space for people to linger um, because there wasn't so much traffic, but you were able to park your car and get out, um, but without impeding the access of um, bus riders and bicyclists and pedestrians. Um, at, so at this time, Kevin DeLeon had been recently elected. And so um, Eagle Rock and the rest of that council district were represented by him starting in October of 2021. So he released a statement in opposition to moving forward with the BRT plan, calling on Metro to hold in-person meetings to allow the community, again, the community, who is the community to understand the option. And this was in the time of peak COVID. So they had spent a couple of years preceding this, working on this. And so a lot of the meetings have been Zoom meetings and a lot of the workshops have been on online as well. And so he was trying to get you know, in-person meetings and not just the online. Um, but Haas that was working on this said that the agency has held roughly two dozen meetings on the project since 2018. So in the space of three years, that's 24 public meetings, which I think sounds like plenty of community engagement, even for somewhere with a lot with, you know, a dense population like Los Angeles County. Um, and that did not include the pop-ups, the presentations and the working groups. So based on this, we're looking at a framework that is a claim, a counterclaim, stakeholders, a good faith interpretation and benefit of the doubt, and then potential coalition members. And so this is kind of extracted from the case studies that I looked at to look at all the different actors and the mechanisms and kind of distill that down in a way that we can deconstruct the message. So we're gonna do a couple of exercises with some tweets. So the first tweet is, about bike and pedestrian safety. And if you're not familiar with the way that quote tweets work, the bottom one is the original tweet. And then the one on top is the commentary on that tweet. So the first tweet is from a user with the screen name Vernon Lord. And he said, getting high centered on a poorly planned bike lane at Gorge and Tillicum is chill as hell. And so this person quote tweets that and said, let's rewrite that. This bad driver was stopped by a hardened bike lane before they hit anybody. So let's deconstruct that. So the claim is that the barrier is bad because it damages cars. And then the counterclaim is the barrier is good because it stops cars from entering the bike lane. And so we can go into some of our other elements and look at our stakeholders, which are drivers and bicyclists, which are the users of the roadway. The good faith interpretation and benefit of the doubt is that um, drivers are, oh, th this driver does not want their car, which is an expensive asset to be ruined by bike barriers. And honestly, I think that's fair. You know, we should have it set up so that people can drive, not have to worry about hitting things. You know, obviously be aware, but make it as pretty much as easy as possible um, to kind of avoid interfering with other infrastructure or individuals. So potential coalition members, for this issue are drivers who are concerned about protecting their asset, local officials, safe streets advocates, and bicyclists. And our solution could be more signage to warn drivers about the barriers and traffic calming ahead of the barrier. Especially if this is new, maybe people aren't used to it. They're not, they don't know that it's there. They don't know what to expect it. But even if people you know, are used to it, you still need that signage to warn people who don't come through there very often. Um, and just to make it, um, make people aware so that they can take proper action and not, you know, getting high centered because it, this isn't cool. Um, but at the same time, like the purpose of this is to protect the bicyclist and it works. So I think that that is a way that we can come to a conclusion on that issue. Another one is affordable housing as a topic. And so this is um, another quote tweet and I have them broken out. So the one on the right is the original tweet and the one on the left is the commentary. So Kobe says, if we're serious about solving um, the housing crisis, we'll have to adopt solutions that are currently illegal in many cities. Building single residency occupancies and studios could allow people who don't need much space to save on the higher costs that come with larger spaces. This can be done well. And some of the images cut off, but you can see that they have different elements. Like there's a loft over to minimize, minimize the amount of space taken up by the bed and make this space more efficient. And then Andy Twinklepants says, I've said this many times, but if someone puts urbanist in their bio, 
you can ignore everything they ever say. The future these weirdos want is landlords renting out eight by eight windowless boxes for $3,500 a month. Um, and also going into like the construction and like the hidden elements and the non-transparency. I don't know if people are familiar with the future these weirdos want or the future liberals want. There's an original tweet was this is the future liberals want. And it's people dressed up in different um, costumes on for pride on the train and it's different kinds of people sitting next to different kinds of people and people are like this is the future liberals want and everybody was like yes it is the future we want um so that's a reference to that which i think is kind of another layer to our conversation on media literacy and making things clear for people um our analysis of this is that the claim is that people who promote studios and single room occupancy options are just shields for landlords um, because they're promoting options that make it to where you know landlords can extract more money for less space um, and that you know they're they're really taking opportunities and autonomy away from people who maybe don't want to live in tiny little apartments um, but that these people are supporting that to be the only option and that's you know enriching landlords who you know some people are opposed to the counterclaim is that studios and single room occupancies are for people who do not need much space. So um, we can look at our stakeholders, um, our developers, people who are housing insecure and housing affordability advocates. A good faith interpretation and benefit of the doubt view of this, um, this quote tweet is this person is concerned about people being overcharged to live in uninhabitably small spaces. Um, our potential coalition members are people who do not want to maintain a lot of space, older adults, single fit people, renters and competitive markets, developers, and affordable housing advocates. Uh, and our solution could be to ensure enough variety of housing is built so people can afford as much space as they need and make the right choice for them. And I think that that's a really important point about making sure enough variety is built because it's not really about the single room occupancy or anything else part of the problem is that we don't have enough housing first of all to meet for everybody to be housed and that's like a big problem for housing affordability but we also don't have all the types of housing that people want um, if you've ever tried to find a studio apartment you know that they're exorbitantly expensive and extremely scarce and so we don't just need one more type of housing built which is correct because if you only build more you know smaller units than sros then that's not going to be meet the needs of people who need three and four and five bedrooms. But if you are making it to where the people who need one bedroom and like one small space are not, you know, out competing families with by having rooms with roommates, because that's a big thing is a lot of people are having rooms with roommates and houses with that could otherwise house a family. So I think that, you know, kind of both people aren't necessarily wrong here, but there's a, a middle ground solution, I think. So our last one is um, going to talk about lower transportation costs. So the original tweet said new vehicles priced under $25,000, a range that the average American might deem affordable, now account for less than 5% of all sales. And then our, um, our quote tweeter, E.W. Niedermeyer says, affordable cars are one of the four assumptions underlying this country, and I'm skeptical that they're ever coming back. This is going to be a problem. So we can look at our analysis, um, which is the claim is it is bad that Americans can no longer afford a personal vehicle. And then we have a counterclaim, which is not inside of this tweet. It's not content that we're extracting from this tweet. It's something that we are able to propose from our own expertise, experience, knowledge, um, and things that we see in practice which is this is an opportunity to capture the constituency of middle-class people who can no longer afford to drive, specifically for transit projects or other transportation options. So our stakeholders are people who are already rent burdened or struggle to pay for private automobiles, car salesmen worried about loss of demand, people who live in car dependent places. Um, and then our good faith interpretation and benefit of the doubt is that loss of affordable private vehicles will hold people back from autonomous mobility. Um, because we know that a lot of places are just not accessible unless you have a car or inside of a car and not having enough cars for people 
ends with some people not being able to ac access education, work opportunities, or meet their basic needs for groceries or medical care. So our potential, um, our potential coalition members are the Safe Streets Advocates, middle and low-income people, transit operators, and people who support infill and walkable communities. And then the solution could be to expand affordable housing and public transportation options, um, offer e-bike subsidies to replace some car trips, and work with employers to expand commuting options. And so this is kind of a way where we come at this from all sides, and we look at the core problem, which is people not having mobility. It's not really about the access to cars. It's more access to getting the places that they need to go. And then we can look at ways to satisfy that demand. Because even though this isn't explicitly about housing, a lot of times the issue is that we don't have enough housing in our walkable communities for people who would like to live there to be able to live there. And so that's a way that you can kind of satisfy that demand so that people aren't having to have a car because of the places that they can't afford to live. So in conclusion of the presentation, um, like I said in our last example, the counterclaim was not expressed within the content. And that is because we as planners know what broader goals and solutions are, and we can posit the counterclaim without needing to extract it. But it is very important to be able to deconstruct the other messages in order to kind of meet the message where it's at with our own message. Um, we need to identify what is already being said and connect those specific concerns to the strategies for housing and mobility um, and making sure that we're coming all the way through because th there are valid concerns that opponents have to important projects and we need to figure out what that core concern is instead of getting caught up in, you know, this broader, well, I don't want, I don't want a bus lane because it's going to increase congestion. Well, what can you do to meet that to make that person a part of your coalition and meet the needs that they're expressing. Um, we also see in our case studies that council members are prone to capture by property le leveraging stakeholders. A lot of times homeowners are the ones that have the biggest um, say in public conversations, even if that's not exclusively said. Explicitly said, a lot of times we give a homeowner a lot more credibility and um, legitimacy than we do a renter. We see homeowners as more permanent fixtures of the community. We don't always look at renters that way. And so that's a property leveraging stakeholders that a lot of times our council members aren't people that participate in ridership of public transit. Um, sometimes they are, sometimes they bike, but a lot of times we kind of have this segment of perspectives that is, you know, the people who are leveraging the property are very much aligned with the lived experience of the people that are council members. And so making sure that we expand that, we're making, and that we're not just letting one kind of um, voice dominate our conversation. And we have to find ways to situate our would-be would -be opponents into the pro-housing and pro-transit coalitions. There is a place for everybody. Even people who don't want to ride the bus can benefit from having bus service available. Even people that don't use bike lanes would benefit from not having bicycle sharing space with cars. Um, and not everybody that, you know, wants to live in, you know, people that want to live in a bigger space, they still benefit from people having access to smaller spaces because you're able to meet the unique needs that people have instead of trying to force everybody to buy a single family home. That's just not the way that you satisfy needs. So um, I have one more thing I would like to share. It is a quote from that Kellner and Share article, and I apologize that it's such a long quote. I'm going to read it to you, but I really like it, and I really feel like it speaks to several aspects of this presentation that, and the issues that we've looked at. Um, so the final thought is, it is highly irresponsible in the face of saturation by internet and media culture to ignore these forms of socialization and education. Consequently, a critical reconstruction of education should produce pedagogies that provide media literacy and, and enable students, teachers, and citizens to discern the nature and effects of media culture. From this perspective, media culture is a form of pedagogy that teaches proper and improper behavior, gender roles, values, and knowledge of the world. Individuals are, are often not aware that they are being educated and constructed by media culture as its pedagogy is frequently invisible and unconscious. This situation calls for critical approaches that make us aware of how media constructs meaning, 
influence and educate audiences, and impose their messages and values. Critical media literacy involves cultivating skills and analyzing media codes and conventions, abilities to criticize stereotypes, dominant values, and ideologies, and competencies to interpret the multiple meanings and messages generated by media text. Media literacy helps people to use media intelligently, to discriminate and evaluate media content, to critically dis dissect media forms, to investigate media effects and uses, and to construct alternative media. So that's kind of my call to action is for planners to participate in constructing the alternative media um, there's different ways to do that, and um, you know, I'm sure many of the people I'm talking to are very experienced practitioners and have ideas for that. But I think it's really important that in constructing that alternative media, you start with deconstructing the messages that are already out there. So thank you. Um, I don't know if anybody has questions or concerns. I'm going to try to find the chat box. I can go ahead and read you um, some that have come in. Okay, do you want me to, I'll just stop sharing, that'll fix it. Okay. Okay. I wasn't sure if I could do both. All right. Um, somebody asked, what approaches have you found to be most effective in addressing misinformation circulating in communities, particularly, particularly when it's circulated by stakeholders not operating in good faith? So I will admit I don't have a lot of experience with practice um, because I've been a student. However, I do have a little bit of experience. I've been working this semester with a firm, a land use firm, the Lavasso and Associates, and we've been working with smaller communities in throughout rural Louisiana. And I think what's really important in approaching that is to make sure that you're addressing the concern that they have. And if there's misinformation, having a way to to speak to that where you're addressing the central concern of the misinformation and you're kind of coming back with it in a way that's not just, you know, the standard messaging re repurposed, but that really gets at that. Some things that I've seen that have been effective elsewhere have been kind of like fact sheets, like true and false sheets, like, you know, common misperceptions or FAQ kind of style where it's like, you know, people think this, you know, is it true that this, and then have a response. And, um, you know, that can be disseminated as flyers or as graphics on social media, um, and pretty much anywhere that you see people having, spreading this misinformation. I think that producing something very clean and concise like that, where you take the misinformation that's being spread and specifically addressing it can be very helpful. Um, and I also think that when it comes to approaches that you found to be in addressing misinformation, I think it's also important to find people where they are. Facebook is very popular among some of the people that are against um, projects or that are concerned about things. Um, I went recently, we were doing outreach event in West Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and there was this lady there that kept saying, well, I saw on Facebook about this, or, you know, I'm going to talk about this on Facebook and there wasn't really anything that we were doing to be opposed of it's just you know rewriting the comprehensive plan um, and so we were getting input from community members on what they would like to see the direction of the community um, but she was very much up in arms about you know the things that we were talking about and so I think that you know creating that graphic maybe and like disseminating it where you know people are actively having those conversations online um, people are having these conversations outside of you know, the input that we explicitly ask from them. Um, and so finding that where it's at and then using that to really be precise in the kind of counter messaging that you're presenting. All right, um, Justin Clark says, the examples you provided are great for a situation with two views. Have you tested your approach with commentary that includes multiple points of view? Say a plan that it suggests a new road where there are supporters of the road, those who oppose all new roads, and those who want a road in a different place. That's a really good um, scenario. I think that starting with kind of the binary option and then expanding it into, you know, addressing those multiple approaches, multiple approaches, because basically, you know, in that you have a build option, you have a no build option. And then if you think of it kind of like a tree, so you have the build option and the no build option. And then under the build option, you'd have it somewhere else. And so I think establishing a 
consensus around the build first is what's important. It's kind of a two-step. And then you do that. So I think kind of arguing for the necessity of the road. Um, and I also think it depends on what kind of the question is about whether it goes where it's supposed to go or not. And then moving forward from that, obviously if it's, if people are opposed to it because it goes through, you know, it, it compromises the environment or it's gonna go through somewhere that people are concerned about, that's important to keep in mind. Um, but I think, you know, that's one approach depending on what it is. If the concern is about, you know, precisely where it's going through and not really a no build build thing, that's one thing to keep in mind. But yeah, I think that's a very great question. I haven't really looked at examples where there's multiple, unless you wanna think about the, uh, the beautiful boulevard because some of the people that were opposed to it were proposing a different thoroughfare. So it really did come down to um, getting people together on that Colorado option. But a lot of times that's a strategy for people to kind of like distract. So they'll say, oh, we don't mind if you build it, we just don't want it here. But that's a strategy to keep it from being built at all. So I think it really depends on um, kind of the elements that are at play, whether it's build versus no build or the the alternative is really a distraction and people aren't in good faith about that. Um, okay, so Ben Sell is asking, have you come across an example of where the recommended approach was followed and successful to at least some degree? Um, not necessarily because mostly this is about breaking down um, some case studies from research that I've looked at. Um, here, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily recommending a specific approach. I'm more so talking about how to break it down in order to inform an approach. So I would really you know, be excited to hear about if y'all have examples of ways that you've combated misinformation um, because a lot of you have a lot of experience with this. And um, so that's exciting to look forward to is how people can, you know, move forward that with that or, or bring in some examples of, of how they've combated some misinformation. Okay, Marlo Ford says, I have also wondered, how do you begin to unravel the post-World War II model of what is a good, desirable, livable communities? Until we unravel that narrative, it will be challenging. Um, I think that that is absolutely true that that's kind of what's dominant in our community. I think that what's important is, is being able to like talk to people and present this alternative view of something like housing or transportation in a way that complements the need that they already have. So for example, a lot of my friends that I talk to that drive cars and they're, they don't ride the bus, they talk about how if the bus would come more often, they would ride it, you know what I mean? Or if, you know, you talk to people who, there's a lot of, we have a, a problem in this country where we have an aging population where a lot of people live in houses that are bigger than they can maintain. And so maybe those people would benefit from smaller units, but you have to really kind of situate the solution that is being proposed in kind of this framework where it does meet a need that isn't being met by this post-World War II model. So I don't think it's easy to unravel that narrative, but I think introducing these smaller solutions that are in line with our best practices for dramatic climate change um, by changing our transportation housing mix, I think it's really important to really hear out those concerns and connect maybe where that model isn't satisfying a need to a solution. Um, yeah, and Marla Ford said, as a follow-up, because this is an intrinsic belief, it is hard to change the narrative add the media and internet and planners really have a challenge. I actually think that the internet and the media have been really effective in propagating a different view. So on Instagram, there's all these accounts like Car Free Toronto, Bike Uneasy, um, Look at This FN Street in New Orleans. There's all of these different accounts and things where they just constantly are pumping out um, images about how much space cars take up, how dangerous cars are. Um, there's a whole side of Twitter that's like urbanist Twitter and like Yimby Twitter where people talk about how we need to have more housing built, you know, yet Yimby, which is yes in my backyard as an opposed to NIMBY, which is not in my backyard, which is a popular way that opposition to um, new development has been framed. So I actually think that the, the media and the internet are a really big tool 
for people to get exposed to on alternative view because most people that live in the U.S. just simply have not had the opportunity to live somewhere where there's they don't have to have a car and they can access their basic amenities. Um, I've had the privilege of living in Colombia in South America where I had a perfectly happy middle class, you know, existence, and I could walk places and you know take motor taxis and get my groceries and whatnot, um, and it was a lot easier because I didn't have a car. So I think that the internet can offer people a kind of a laboratory for ideas for them to see things that maybe they don't have access to and observe how it would be better and see arguments and research. Um, so I do agree that the intrinsic belief is an issue, but I also think the internet is a really big opportunity to unravel that. Okay, um, an anonymous attendee says, at the start of your presentation, you defined media very broadly, including LinkedIn posts, YouTube, et cetera. Given this broad interpretation, we may ask what is not media today? If everyone is posting messages online with potentially manipulative content, is media literacy just literacy in any online discussion? Or does this even extend to face-to-face -face discussions in real life? I totally agree with where this um, question is is going that you know pretty much everything is media pretty much everything is media I think kind of a distinction is when is something being presented that is more of like not a facade but it's more of this outward facing presentation and when is something like a one-to-one -one interaction and I think that that would be where I draw that distinction you know the conversations I have with my friends like those are constructed you know messages but they're co-constructed between me and the other person. Um, so in like linguistics, they call that interlocutors. And when you're having a conversation, you together are constructing a meaning of the conversation. I would even say this webinar is kind of like in between those things, especially because I'm answering questions. There's this co-construction of meaning and it's not just this one-sided, like creating something that's being presented. And then you, it is like all media is a two-way street because eventually somebody consumes it and they deconstruct it but I think the difference between media is it being put out and then somebody else is kind of on another end versus an in real life interaction is a co-construction message but yeah I do think it's very broad it's very broad and that's why I think it's very important because the things that end up end up Kind of constructing our more official resources like the ASHTO guides for highways or our policy on housing, um, our zoning ordinances, our you know guidance from the federal government on the bipartisan, bipartisan infrastructure law, all of those things like all the way track back to these individual conversations, these intrinsic beliefs, and these media messages that people are exposed to. And I think that going back to the source and being able to understand where that's negotiated is really important and being able to present a policy opportunity or like a change to policy or policy solution where people are able to understand that as something that meets their needs. Um, and I think that all of this like online media gives us a really fast opportunity to in real time be like, no, actually, this housing would be good for you for this reason. Like, even if you're going to stay in your single family home, it's good for people to have apartments because it brings these benefits to you um, and identifying, like, actually what the concern is. Because a lot of times, like in our, our earlier um, question from, from Justin Clark, where he talked about, you know, there's multiple sides to people who support the road, people who oppose all new roads and people who want a road in a different place. Sometimes the people who want a road in a different place are deflecting and they're creating like a, a red herring straw man kind of thing where people are like, look at this problem. Like we don't need it. It's, it's not really about, you know, we don't want new housing. We're trying to protect the turtles on this parking lot, you know, like that there, I don't know if y'all are familiar with like there's historic parking lots and historic parking structures throughout the U.S. that have come out of NIMBYism. Um, so yeah, thanks for that question and um, definitely agree with you that it's very broad. I do think the distinction is the co-construction versus the putting it out there and having it deconstructed separately. Um, so Alex Long says, going back to new roads, my environmental friends are totally against any new roads, but the area population has increased so much more transportation is needed and this is in a rural area where vehicles are required. 
Um, that is an issue. I would say that it goes back, you know, I'm, I am sure that most people in your community do need vehicles, but I would also think about what is the way that you can construct that transportation to where it kind of brings down, where it creates opportunities for people to maybe have bus access somewhere. Where can you find the funding for that? When you're building out the road, are you building a complete street? Um, what are we doing to make sure that our roads are maintained so that you're not just building new roads to replace old roads? Um, you know, that's that's an issue. And, you know, my environmental friends are totally against any new roads. Like, that's a set of values that people have. I don't think, you know, personally, I don't think no new roads is the solution to things. But I think that that identifying ways that you could maybe have some infill in your downtown area um, or support some, you know, some solutions to where it's not just about building new roads so you can get more cars through, but what can you do to kind of create opportunities for that? There's also things that you can do with some of the funds that you get for roads where you could um, do the land banking and some of the environmental mitigation. And so that's a way that you can incorporate people. So um, that was my last one. Thanks so much for your questions. And then I'm looking at Julian's comments in the chat. So, oh, Tammy Holt has something else. Um, I don't know what time it is. Yeah. So Tammy Holt says, um, great presentation. Considering the opposition, have you identified an approach that planners could use to better collaborate with stakeholders to ensure successful outcomes and change? Um, this is a really great question. This is um, definitely food for thought on what you can do. Um, again, I haven't had that much practice, so I don't have like super concrete examples, but I think looking at that beautiful boulevard example is a really good one if you want to look more into that. That um, I think was an excellent execution of bringing together disparate interests to really push forward that one lane opportunity um, for the bus rapid transit. So that's a, that's a suggestion I would give is to look more into that. Um, beautiful Boulevard in Eagle Rock in Los Angeles County. You're muted, Jillian. Thank you. <laughs> if there are no other questions, I just want to thank Bailey so much. It was an excellent presentation um, that offered a lot to think about. Um, I will encourage attendees to keep their eyes peeled on their inboxes for an incoming email with contact information and slide decks. Um, and the link to the YouTube where this um, webinar is, the recording will be posted. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much, Bailey. Do you have any final comments or anything you'd like to add? Um, I That's pretty much it. I just really appreciate everybody's comments. If my contact information is supposed to go out, so I would love it if people have examples of things that they've done or any feedback again with some concrete experience that they'd like to share with me. I think that would be very helpful um, just for everybody to think about how to, you know, continue with um, having a very effective um, interpretation of things that people are saying about our project. So I would love if anybody has any examples or things that they'd like to share about their practice, so please email me about it. I'd love to hear about it and chat further. Um, I, I will say we did, we have some time. So I just want to let you know that another question did come in from Elizabeth Hag. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Is there anything that can be done to deal with how different people interpret the same message differently? I think that's where diversity inclusion is really important and having people that are participating on whether it's your staff or um, commissioners or stakeholders or bringing in your advocacy organizations to where they're able to participate with saying, hey, I think that maybe this isn't getting across the message you think it's getting across. Um, and also maybe tailoring some of your messaging, whether it's you know through your outreach with different events and, and producing multiple versions of the same message to where you're able to reach different people, um, not just having like one resource, one flyer, but having a couple of different ones. I think that that's a way to address that on the front end is making sure you have things presented multiple ways because not everybody you know likes to read long things some people really aren't satisfied with something that's very short they want to have more detail 
So having that at different levels, kind of a scaffolding approach, I think can be helpful. Okay, well, thank you very much, Bailey. I appreciate your time um, and your presentation, which was really informative. All right, thank you. Thank you, everyone.